Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel. I hope you're not getting sick of hearing that. Because when that was happening, that was a message from the angel to Joseph saying, Listen, even though you see no hope, even though there's no hope, remember what happened when, when Isaiah was telling this to King Ahaz. Even though there was no hope, and everything was up against you, and evil was surrounding us, God is coming. And he's going to be with us. And that was the message that, that you know, night when Joseph couldn't sleep and the angel said, listen, before you go and you blast this to the streets that Mary had cheated on you and now is pregnant, let me tell you exactly what's happening. God is coming to be with us. This series has been about us looking back and saying, you know, really is Christmas about anything more than that? I know we give gifts and you tell the kids, listen, we give gifts. Our kids are back there having a happy birthday Jesus party. I mean, they're blowing kazoos or whatever you call those things that go out. Or, I mean, they have hats. I mean, there are balloons everywhere. And we're telling them, this, we're, we are celebrating this Christmas, happy birthday Jesus. But what, why are we even celebrating that? Why are there students back there playing and having fun with them? Why are we celebrating because God was coming to be with us. I mean, how I don't, for me, as I look at this, look at this in this series and, and how those three simple words, God with us, how that impacts our lives is just huge. These are words that, that gave hope to the king. They're words that brought Joseph down from the ledge, right? He was ready. He was ready to, just to tell everybody. They're words that proved Mary faithful whenever she was, you know, she was contacted. And, and it's like, you know, what, what, are, what are you saying? And she said, yes, I, 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 I want to be faithful. I want to do this. What have those, those three words, as we've been talking about them these, these last few weeks, what have they really meant to you over this Christmas season? As my friend Mark Robertson was, was gathering 20 bales of hay yesterday at some wherever, I'm just thinking, you know, and he sends me that picture, and you saw it on Facebook, I guess, and, and I'm just thinking, you know, as he's throwing these in and his straws everywhere, he's probably sneezing and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, but as he's doing that, is he really thinking, what is this all this for, really? You know, what, why are we doing this? Why are we inviting people tonight? What's the, what's the whole connection to this? And it's to communicate to people that God is with us. Is it any more? Is it any more than that when we see that? What has it meant to you today as we were singing these songs or people were saying hi to you as you were coming in? What, what does those three words mean to you? Or when you're needing hope or when you're on the ledge of life, what do those three words mean to you? Well, see, those three words are meant to change everything. They're meant to change everything. How, how our news is, is communicated, or how, we com or how we view it. You know, when we see things that are terrible that happen, those three words change everything. They change everything for us. They'll change everything for us in the future. God came down to be with us. And what we know, and what we'll look at today, is that there's nothing that can separate us from his love for us. There's nothing that can separate. I mean, the first week, you know, we, we were looking at the origin of the word and, and how I just mentioned it with the king and, and how it's up against him. And what's the origin? Why was the angel even talking about that? Because we can have hope and rest in that, that, that God's going to be here and he's going to be with us. Last week, we talked about how he's working through us to each other. You know, you see people up here like young Kaylee. I mean, she's just a student. She's up here, up here just singing. And I, and I told her just a little while ago, I was like, you know, there's people out there that just need to be communicated God's love to them. They just, when they see, they, they want to know that other people are excited about what, they're, about what they're singing. You know, I just think, man, we connect through each other. When we, when we say God is with us, but we're connecting through each other. And we talked about that last week. But I think for each one of us, as, we, as we're looking at even these three words, we fall into this thinking, don't we? That we can be separated from this love of God. That we can be lost from this love. We even use the phrasing, don't we? Don't we say words like, man, he's just, he's lost, man. Or she's really lost her way. We, we use these terms all, all the time and we hear them. I mean, someone who's acting irrationally, what do we say? They've lost it. But isn't that what our hope is, that we can't be lost from God? 
That even though we recognize God's with us, he's here, he came down, we're having Christmas. Sometimes we miss out on the real favor and the real blessing that he has for us because we feel like we can be separated or we feel like we can be lost. Now, there's no feeling like being lost, right? I mean, none of us like it. None of us, I mean, and I was looking at some statistics yesterday. I was thinking, you know, what, how do we feel about being lost in our culture? From 2005 to 2010, listen to this, there were nearly 70 million GPS units sold. 70 million, just from 2005 to 2010. And it's gone up 30% in the last two years, even. That once we figured out a way that I don't want to be lost, and there's going to be some help here, I don't want to be lost, we started putting those things everywhere. On Wednesday, Google Maps, what did they do? They released their app for the iPhone, and immediately, Thursday morning, it jumped up to number one globally as the app that everybody wanted. I do not want to be lost. Because that is, for us, naturally, we don't do well when we're lost. We are out of control. Amen? What about married couples? I don't have the stat, but I promise you there is a high divorce rate that started in the car when we were lost somewhere. Isn't that right? I mean, it, I mean we just all know it. I mean, whatever. We're in the, we're in the car. We're gone. The one, what we said, go this, one of us said, go this way. One of us said, go that way. No. And probably neither one of them are right. And then, you know, it's like, I told you we should have gone. You know, I mean, the, the arguments. Because none of us like to be lost because we're out of control. So as we're looking, we're looking at this this morning, you know, there's something, you know, something that, that spiritually, emotionally, relationally, physically, God doesn't want us to be lost either. He obviously doesn't want us just in chaos. It's apparent that when we are considered lost by ourselves or separated from God, we feel like he's not around our lives get worse. You ever had this? I mean, have you ever known someone who was connected to God? And then you saw that maybe they, you know, they're, they're distant now. They're, they're not, they don't, you know, maybe they're not in church, not in a community group, whatever else. They're just kind of distant now. Have you ever seen a person like that? And then you said that you thought that they're better off? I don't think I've ever, so I'm, and I, yeah, I might be biased because I'm a pastor, but I mean, I, as, I'm, as I'm seeing people's lives, and I've seen hundreds of families, I've seen people who are disconnect, who are connected to God, you know, coming, engaged, serving a part of what God's kingdom is going, and then somehow disconnected. And I can tell you to the family, to the person, I've never seen their life better for it. Because when we feel disconnected from God, things just don't get better. There's a story in Luke 15 that I want to share. Most of you know it as the prodigal son or the lost son. As, I'm, as I was looking at this story, I was thinking, you know, God came down to be with us. And Jesus, when he was even telling this story, was basically telling the people, anybody who would listen, that I'm here so that you can be connected to this God. And even though you may be gone and lost, this is, this, I'm here so that you can be together with him. Listen to this, starting in Luke 15, verse 11. And Jesus is telling them the story. He says that there's a certain man that had two sons. And the younger son, the younger of them, said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Give to me what I am entitled to have. Now the younger son, remember, only got a third of the, of the inheritance. The older son got the two-thirds. So he was even, you know, let me just take my third and let me go, okay? And listen, under Jewish custom was not to ever give the inheritance early like that. That's not what a father was supposed to do. But anyway, the father, so he divided, what did he say? So he divided to them his livelihood. Isn't that the story of God right there? Isn't that what makes I was, when I was younger, I remember talking to younger kids in, you know, in, in ministry like a Chris here and just communicating to middle school kids. They're like, what do you, they would say, what do you love about God so much? What do I love about God? And I still love to this day is that we have freedom. That we have the freedom to choose. And when I read this story, it, 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 this, this communicates to me that God permits each person to go his own way. That you can decide. That wouldn't we, wouldn't, wouldn't none of us, we, we, we wouldn't like this, this God who forced us, would we? 
But there's something about us being in love with this God who, who lets us choose. And in the story, even though it wasn't the custom, what does the father do? He just says, listen, I'll, okay, I'll, 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 I'll give to you what you feel is entitled to you. And not many days after, the, the, the younger son gathered all together and he journeyed to a far country. And there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. He wasted his possession. The verb here means to scatter and dispersed in any way he could. All which was given to him. When we look at the, the word prodigal, it, descri it describes this extravagant life. That when he was away from the father's care, he went into a life of just debased living. Separated. But when he, had, when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country where he was, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Why was this important? Because don't we know that the Jews, what did they think about the pigs? They said that's the most unclean place you can ever go. Don't be around them. Don't ever, I mean, it, it, it would be terrible. But what does the son end up doing? He ends up feeding the swine. Matter of fact, as we see in the story, he ends up wanting to eat what the pigs were eating. And when he could gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, no one wanted to give him anything. But when he came to himself, he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Do you see a change of attitude? Isn't that our stories? Isn't that our stories? Even though we know even though we know the story of God coming down, even though we know the story of Christmas, that at times for us, we can just be, we can feel lost, we can feel separated, and we can feel in so much need that we just say, you know, I've got to come to my senses and remember where I came from. Remember what my relationship, where my relationship is with God. And what does he say? He begins, begins to become contrite. And he's going to say, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Look at his heart. So he arose, and he came to his father. But he, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, and he had compassion. Have you ever just read this part, and you just go right over it? And you just move on to the party and the fatty calf and all that stuff. And you're just like, wow, that's a great story. Do you realize that when, we're, when we feel like we're lost and we're separated and we're coming back to God, that, and, and we're so, I mean, you know, we walk in and we're just like, I'm going to go try church again. And you walk in. I had a terrible weekend. I had a terrible week. I shouldn't have yelled at her. I shouldn't have been. I mean, and you're walking in. Do you realize that the Father has been looking and searching for you from far off? For me, when I, <clears throat> when I read this story, I think of the father every day, every day was watching. And I mean, I, that's, that's for each one of us. I, I feel like that. That there's not that separation that we think there is. That when we are ready to be, when we're ready to come back and we're ready for that redemption, he's already looking for us. He's already seen us. Is that good news to you when you hear that? And the, uh, let's see, and he rose and he came to the father, but when he was still a great way away, his father saw him and he had compassion and he ran and fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and earth. He had already practiced it. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He's already said it in his head a hundred times. And here's what I want to tell you. I want redemption, but I know I'm not worthy of even being your son. He's already spent his inheritance. But the father said to his servants, no, let me tell you what you do. Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. He's part of the family. What was the ring about? Put the ring on his hand. He's a part of our family. 
Haven't we felt that way whenever we are been away from church maybe a few weeks? Maybe a few months? And you come back in and you just feel like, I'm not really going to be a part. I'm just going to sit in here and hopefully I get some hope and then I'll leave again. And then someone, you walk in, somebody's like, where have you been? And they hug you and you're just like, I'm still a part of this. I'm still a part of this family. Why is that? Because we read stories like this where Jesus is telling the story of a son who was far off and he went his own way and he came back. And Jesus, and Jesus says, the father said, no, you're part of the family. Get the ring and put it on his finger. Put sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. Let us party for this. For this was my son. He was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. And it's the story of believers everywhere. He was dead and now he's alive. We become lost and then we're found because the Father's looking for us. This is the God who came to be with us. A God who's constantly searching and looking and wanting us to come back to him. And this is a story for us when we're struggling. We're going through this, this period maybe in our lives. We call it a funk or whatever. When we're living away from God and we think, I could never get back. And it's the God who's in the watchtower looking for you to come back down the road. And what does it say? He says, for my son was dead, alive again. He was lost and is found, and they begin to be merry. They begin to party. I love that. We look over in Romans 8, 37 and 39. I want to share this verse with you too. As Paul was telling the church, don't forget the story of the prodigal son. Don't forget that you cannot be separated. And he tells them in Romans 8, 37. He says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. When you say, yeah, God, God loves me, do you consider yourself in victory? I just wonder about that. Like when we really say that out loud, God, yeah, you know, there is a God that loves me. Do you consider yourself winning? Do you consider yourself in victory? Well, you should, because what the scripture tells us right here, yet we know this, that in all things, we are more than conquerors. I don't know about you, but when somebody conquers something, I feel like they're winning. Now, when Paul says you're more than that, then I take it to another level, I guess. Take it to the next level, that you are more than that. That means you are unstoppable when we read this. So then what does he say in verse 38? Very powerful, a verse you probably should have on your bathroom mirrors everywhere. He says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, or evils, or powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor things in the past, nor height, nor depths, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Why am I even reading you this? Why am I saying, oh yes, it's a verse just in, in, in Romans that, that can you read it and you make it make you feel good? And does it even pertain to Christmas? How does it even work with Christmas? Yes, it pertains to Christmas because when the angel was saying God would be with us, he was saying that Emmanuel was coming, the Savior of the world, in Jesus Christ, and when we read this in Romans, he said that there's nothing that can separate us from this Savior who's coming. In Christ Jesus. But you know, as well as I do, that we live in a culture where we just want to say God. We just want to say, well, God, God, I believe in God. God loves me. But does God, do you believe in the God through Jesus Christ? Emmanuel, God with us. Do you believe in that God? Because I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not too shy to say it, that when we read this, and he's listing off all these things, and it falls under every category that you may have, every category that you may have, and I listed them all, and I'd love to do it again, but I'm just saying every category that he says that there, there shall be no separation from the love of God. We hear that, yes, through Emmanuel. So when we hear this this season, and we're looking at this, and we're reading these scriptures, and we're saying God is with us, are we reading it and saying, man, he's with us through his son? Yeah, Jesus is the reason for the season. We're spouting off all these and we're singing these, but wow, there's nothing I can go through. There's no evil that we can see or, or watch or hear about that can separate us from God's love. Do you believe that? There's three points I want you to take home with you today. 
They're in your bulletins. Why do we put them in bulletins for you? Because they're called take-home points. And why are they called take-home points? Because you have office desk, some of you. You have refrigerators, some of you. You have bathroom mirrors, most of you. You have school lockers, some of you. And these are great places that you can put this bulletin and you can say, this today is what I'm going to roll with today. I'm going to believe on this. You have car dashes, you have car consoles. You can put them everywhere. You're getting my point. All right, three points. Here we go. First one, absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Is absolute an absolute? Yes, it is. It's an absolute. There's absolutely nothing that can separate believers from God's love. Now, did I say it's absolutely nothing that can separate people from God's love? No, your relationship with God, your understanding of God, your believing in God and what his son did is what brings us and connects us to him. And once we're connected, there's no separation. It says we are more than conquerors. Wow, read it, have it. If you don't believe me, go to Romans 8, 37, 39, okay? Our next one, our confession of our sin, our confession of our sin is what brings full redemption. Our confession of our sin is what brings full redemption. Every one of you, when someone is very contrite and they apologize to you, there's not a person in here that doesn't, it doesn't make you feel better. There's not a person in here that you have had an experience with that they were really sorry for something that they did and it changed everything. Now, they didn't come to you and feel like they were entitled to be your friend. They didn't come to you and feel like, oh, you know, I'm just, I don't really say sorry to people, but let's just hang out anyway. That doesn't, it doesn't work. And it's, and it's in our DNA because that's how God is too. When we confess our struggles and our sin to him and our, our ability to be lost and separate from him and we come back, we have full redemption. We see the story, we can go back and look at it in, Matthew, or excuse me, in Luke 15. Third one, if God is for us and no created thing can separate us, then our security in him is final. It's final. You don't go any further than that, okay? If God is for us and no created thing, which we just saw in Romans 8, 39, no created thing can separate us, then where we have our security, that's final. There's nothing further than that. Romans 8, 39, take a look at it. And as we were looking right there, we see that the love of God, and we even read it in John three sixteen, that the love of God came through his son, Emmanuel. This season, I'm hoping that you are seeing that as we're going to be celebrating it more and more as we're getting closer. People ask me, you ready for Christmas? You ready for Christmas? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to, I'm really trying to get there and get my focus right and do all of this, but it's everywhere around us. And at the end of the day, really, it comes down to, man, this great God came to be with us. And I'm hoping, hoping that that is a focus for you. Let's pray this morning. Father God, as we just pause here to reflect on, on what your, your holy word means, Father, each one of us, every one of us to the person in here can feel disconnected. We can feel separated, God. We can even feel like we can't come back, God, and we know that's a lie from the enemy. Because, Father, you are looking for us. You're chasing after us. It says in your word that the Father ran after his son and threw his arms around him. Father, the son's heart was to come back and be very contrite, Father. He came and wanted to just get on his knees and say, sorry, I'm not worthy. And Father, I'm praying for us today who need to say that. That we need to say, God, I'm, I'm sorry for, for, for being how I've been. For the attitude I've had. For being disconnected from you. God, maybe I'm not worthy even. And Father, you are a God who puts your arms around us. And you love us. Thank you, God, for being there for us. God, thank you for this church. God, as we just have a safe place to come, Father, to be right here and worship you, God, in freedom. Thank you, Father, for that. Father, I'm lifting up right now those in, here in the church who are, Father, considering to be faithful in their giving to your kingdom. Father, as we, uh, we are good stewards with that, Father, as we are you know, serving our community and, and wanting to reach out, God. And, and Father, just, I'm just praying, God, that, 
you continue to find favor and blessing on, on those who are faithful in their giving. I lift up our tithes and our offerings this morning as, as we give and we think about that, God, that, that you use it to the best of your to the best of your ability, God. Not just ours, but the best of your ability for this church. So, Father, we love you. In, in Jesus' name, amen.